Um, this week we have Robin Harvey, which we're super excited about because she kind of ups the female ratio for us as well. Um, last week, if you didn't miss our episode 13, we had Harley Ingleby and you can check that out on our YouTube channel, Oslog Boarding, as well if you missed any other episodes. So we're going to take it around the coast and we'll start with Nathan who had an epic birthday last weekend. How was it in Victoria and how was your birthday? Hey Kira, hey guys. Um, yep. Yeah. You know, I had a great birthday, actually. It was amazing. Um, thanks for letting me jump off early, Weeksy, and the crew. Um, Victoria, it's just been okay this week. We've had a few onshore days um, and not much swell, but today and even yesterday's first oh, come up. We're looking good for um, this weekend. So it's going to be nice to get some waves hopefully for this weekend, and I think tomorrow's looking good too. So, yeah. Awesome. And super stoked that you can still surf. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's good that we're only in stage three, not stage four. So, but figures are on the uh, decline. So, hopefully, we'll be back to normal soon. Sounds good. So, we will take it up to New South Wales. And Maddie, how's the surf looking where you are? Uh, it's the banks are phenomenal. It's the same banks that I've been surfing predominantly for this whole winter, which has been pretty extraordinary because it's not often you can ride a like a literally rhino gun that I pulled out. You know, like a ten foot gun. And on the same bank, ride a longboard in the next week when it's waist high. But the conditions are great. Offshore winds all week. Um, yeah, really good banks from, you know, I heard the southern beaches are really good. And the whole way up the coast is everywhere. All the southern corners are really good. But a um, bit smaller, no major spell impacts, which is nice. The body gets a little bit of a rest, which was well overdue. And I can finally catch up on some work. Um, Sean interrupted me earlier while I was getting my hands dirty, which has been a rare occurrence the last couple of months, but um, working on some cars and that may be a feature in the, one of the coming episodes. Um, but also I'm meant to be at the state titles, New South Wales state titles today. I was meant to surf right. once or twice and uh, we got a call yesterday. The restrictions had changed overnight and um, yeah, they canceled it with 24 hours notice, which was definitely a hard, challenge and a logistical nightmare i'm sure for surfing new south wales but yeah there were some competitors there but thankfully a lot of us hadn't left yet and um it looked flat there today so maybe we dodged a bullet so it'd be interesting to see what happens with aussie titles and whether they run that because i know those emails just came out for those people who made the team in the states that have run their state titles so i guess they did be- ask me for my money if i wanted my state money back which uh, is probably not a good sign so uh my membership money Good to know, good to know. So this week we're missing Jack, but we're going to take it up to the border zone with Sean. How's it going up there in the Tweed Coast? Yeah, um, we've had conditions this week. Uh, Earlier in the week it was small and clean. Uh, The last couple of days it's been fairly horrible. It's been uh, a little bit bigger because it was almost flat for two days. There's so much sand though, and the council is uh, dredging the Tweed Bar at the moment and dumping the sand anywhere between Kira and uh, Palm Beach. So uh, we thought we had a hell of a lot of sand at the moment, and there's a hell of a lot more coming. <laughs> but, uh, and would that, that be good for the banks there? or what Yeah, the banks are all time once again. Uh, we've had a really good run, just like uh, Matt said down in Sydney and that. and um, Looking at the long-range forecast with the uh, Kira Longwood Classic in mind in a couple of weeks, looks as though that's going to be all time with uh, a four-foot of swell and offshores for a few days. So really uh, looking forward to some more good waves. Woo! Sounds good. So, we see we haven't forgotten about you, even though you're basically in another country all the way over the side <laughs> of Australia. How is it doing in WA and have you been getting waves down there? What's been happening? Mate, it's been really good. Perth Metropolitan is uh, fairly well known for being really sporadic with the waves, but all the way through winter, we've had little banks along the beaches. Had a good little surf at Scarborough Beach yesterday, which is one of the main city beaches right uh, right on the Perth coast. And uh, today I was out selling wax, picking up new shops because I've finally got my car back on the road. So um, for all the WA surf shops, the uh, the Huey's Choice Surf Wax will be coming to you. But 
I'm super excited to have a living legend on the show tonight, Kira. I'm stoked. Absolutely. And I thought I'd start going around because I reckon I could fill the whole show with just an introduction on the profile of Robin Harvey. If you don't know her, she is a legend. Um, definitely, she's currently working in marketing and advertising and design management, but she's been involved in women's surfing and just surfing in general in Australia for a very long time. And first president of Surfing Queensland, which is awesome. And now um, still surfing in the adaptive um, surfing team as well, which she, I'm sure, can fill us in on a lot better than I can. And also back in the day, was sponsored by Coca-Cola. So um, I guess I'll start us off with the first question for you, Robin, and that is the most basic one. Um, when did you begin surfing and what made you want to surf? Well, when you um, live and you were born at the beach at Crescent Head, all you could do was uh, either play golf and go surfing because that was right in front of my home where I live. So I was born and bred here. And um, when I was five, um, I got a little Hanamex cool light surfboard and thought, well, I'll surf and it just seemed easy. And uh, so we all were surfing just right on that point break, right at the front where I lived at home. My dad used to take me down to the beach every day, not that he had to drive because you could just walk. And then when I was 12, I had a real surfboard. Um, Surfing World magazine, which we used to get, had a coupon in there, had to order a board, and I got a um, Keo surfboard. You put your weight and your height, and it was a longboard. I'd never, ever ridden a shortboard, so it was a longboard. And then it came up from Brookvale on the train, and my dad got it in Kempsey off this train, and... I started surfing on a long board, a real surfboard when I was 12, but I was surfing prior to that anyway. So living at Crescent Head your whole life, what else would you do there? What, what year was that, Robin, that you got that board? Excuse me. <laughs> you want to know how <laughs> For history, I'm... for nostalgia and history purposes only. <laughs> we know you're a spring chicken. <laughs> All right. 19, 1962, I got that board, mate. <laughs> You are not, not just crawling to you, but you are tremendous for your age. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, look, you can, you can stay here at my place anytime you like to come back to Crescent, Matty. Next call. Thank you. Thanks very much. I definitely won't be sleeping in my van at the car park. Uh, I re- that's for sure. I remember when you were little coming into yeah. the surf cops and getting you into the tournaments and probably pushing you on away. You probably oh. did in my old orange combi with my dad. Yeah. Yes, I remember that well. Awesome. Oh, good. So um, can you tell us, Robin, a little bit more about um, Women in Waves and that program that you started? Yes. um, When I more or less left home, left Crescent, you had to leave then because there was nothing here for us. So I went to art school in Newcastle and I wanted to do design, marketing and fashion and art. And then from then, which I did do a course, but after that, I landed in working in a television station and I did give up surfing after that for a lot of years to have a family, a career. And then um, someone said to me like 20, 30 years, 20 years later, you used to be a good surfer. You know, you represented New South Wales when you were young, you were in the teams in Newcastle, Southside surf team, we beat the Karamala Wahinis. So when I got to Queensland, and with all my work involved there with coke and design and everything, and I thought I wanted to go back and do all my women in the waves. I wanted to design clothing. That's how it started. But then I went back and just mucked around on the surfboard. And lo and behold, I landed in the Queensland team because that's where I kind of met Sean. And we were in the malfunction and I went to Noosa and we did all, I belonged to the Super 8s and did all the surf comps. And then... The, I was sort of, well, I got involved with Surfing Queensland to help um, raise money for them through Coca-Cola and Birch Carroll and Coral Granny Union Cinemas, all the groups that I worked with. And um, then I got my level one surfing instructor, swimming, and I thought, oh, I'm going to teach. I need to teach kids to surf, really. But I got all the women happened to come because they were, they were getting harassed by their husbands and guys in the water and said, will you teach me? And I had a mixture and one of my clients was a um, trademark attorney and he said to me, why don't you trademark? Because I was saying I'm doing women in the waves. 
He said, well, why don't you trademark that? And I said, oh, okay, which I did. And that's really how it started. I trademarked Women in the Waves on the Gold Coast when I started back surfing and got involved heavily with Surfing Queensland because, you know, they were the good umbrella. They were, you know, you've got to belong to them to be under the umbrella of insurance and stuff. And, and I started learning to surf and I had a lot of women. We were bringing buses in from Ipswich all around. They were driving from Brisbane down to the Gold Coast at Kira. And then I started designing my clothing as well. And so we had it all tied in together and then I could grab all my sponsors to help being Coke and all the move, all my clients as such kind of helped supported me and then would support all the teams I got involved in. So but that was years ago. It was really good. And it's really expanded from there. You, you know, there's women, the women are surfing now are just brilliant. It is really good, you know, but I, I did a lot, it was a lot to do with longboarding, more than the shortboarders, but um, no, it was, it was really good and it's still going. I'm still supporting women in the waves and I still you, get... Um, you still to, do your surf school up north in the Gold Coast, no, do you? No, I don't do them now. We don't do them because it's all, it all got licensed off. Before, you could only just have one, like we, I used to do down at Greenmount through Surfing Queensland, but now they're everywhere. So, yeah, no, I don't do it anymore. I do it for the fun of it. Like if someone wants me to teach them or work with them, yeah, I just donate my time. I love it. Just giving back to surfing what it gave to me. Yeah. Unreal. Now, you've obviously made a lot of friends around the place because we've had a lot of interest in uh, on our Facebook page. I don't know about the Instagram sort of things. Maybe Nath can update us on that. But, in fact, um, apart from the first comment on our live stream so far, which was, Nathan, you look good tonight, from Kyle Bonefell. <laughs> <laughs> we've got all these people, these fresh names I haven't seen before. And, and we've got uh, Denny Ball. Obviously, you know Denny Ball. She's Nanny, I love you. Yes, that, that's my daughter with five of my grandchildren. They're probably all watching on the Gold Coast and I can't see. I'd say, I'd say so. She's saying, uh, go, Nanny. And, yeah, that's uh, Billy. Yeah, that's all my grandkids. They'll so, be watching on the Gold Coast. So good day to all the grandkids as well. But um, I, I'm interested how you made the transition from being a competitor to being a contest organiser. You've gone from uh, putting on the rash vest to actually putting up the tents. How did that happen? Um, well, when I, I've always was involved on committees uh, with the, you know, helping out with all the surf comps that we've had, and especially here at Crescent Head. And I've always, always came home, always, I called it home, came back down to Crescent. And then back in, I think it was oh, 2009 or 10, I just can't remember now, we had the big event here in Crescent when it had um, its 21st running of a comp and it was huge. So I ended up look, taking that on as a role as contest uh, organiser. We had a committee and a team and... And I guess it's just over the years, like working with Sean and everybody else, that um, we put this event together and we... Realised you could do it better. Yeah, yeah. I did well. That, that was the best one anyone could do. I think Maddie might have been at that one. We had floods. We had the... Um, you couldn't get into Crescent Head for that comp unless you rode in. We made it all, news all around the world. People just came from everywhere and we ran a comp in the biggest flood you could ever have in... Present Head or Kempsey, you couldn't even get into Present Head. You got road in or people were paddling their surfboards in. And that went for four days, five days. And uh, all the guys, the longboard mags wrote how they could get in. They were stranded all around New South Wales to land to come to this comp. So that was like my swan song. It was a, um, I really enjoyed that one. And, and I just assist and help. If anyone wants any help, I don't mind. I do a lot of judging. I really enjoy judging as well. So, yeah. On that, Robin, um, <laughs> the judging side of things, uh, we have a question that uh, Sean proposed earlier, but it's a great one. Uh, who's the best female surfer you've ever seen? And um, is that surfer still around now? Are they still surfing or is it a modern day surfer? Well, I tell you who I think is really cool is Belinda Bags. I'm, looking, I'm talking longboarders. I love, you know, the shortboard girls, they, 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 they're all good. They're all, you know, stars in their own, but... But um, Belinda Bags, you know, she, she's just good. Rosin, um, there's, a, there's a lot of the girls now that are, and they're still cruising. They're still surfing nicely. Even we've got Jodie Barsby down here. If I get Jodie back in the water, you know, and mm. it's like getting us all back on board and getting back in. And 
they really style, Maddie, like you guys. They they ride nice. They're really lovely riders. Yeah. I think they're better looking than us guys, uh, especially. Well, yes. as, <laughs> Do you know, it's, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Jody and Belinda because um, you know Jody's um, you know never been like super small, but she's always had such petite footwork. And oh, so, she just you know, steps. She cross steps. She's brilliant. It's you know, so like gentle that. and and obviously she flows really well. But you know about the shortboarders too. If you'd ask some of the top shortboarding girls, I know a couple of them. Some of their favourite surfers are like Kalia Moniz, um, you know, in Honolulu. And, and that's a testament, like, to see, you know, the, the longboard and the shortboard girls moving, you know, collaborating, I suppose. The styles, as you just said, they really do overlap. Yes, they do. And, the, and the, I've seen the shortboarders, they can still walk the board and, you know, they just, they're like ballerinas, they're like dancers. They, it's just lovely style. And that's what I've always liked about longboarding, especially watching... You and Jack and all the all the all the kids and Maddie Kay like grow up and just still walk that board. It's 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 a it's a st- it's an art, I think, longboarding. Yeah, that's why I like it better. Yeah. Did you ever jump on shortboards in that transition era? You said you obviously learnt on a longboard. There was no other options back then. But when the no. shortboard came in the seventies and eighties, or you just longboarded? No, I've stayed with the longboards the whole time. I just liked it. It was cruised. It was cool. And the other thing was. Growing up in Crescent Head, I always went right, okay? When I landed on the Gold Coast and you had to get shore breaks to go left and right, and I thought, this is a challenge on a longboard. So I had to master that to do, to do beach starts when you landed in the, the – when you were in the Australian titles and you might have been at Kings Beach or somewhere. I just had to learn all that. And I did learn it on a longboard, yeah. So I stuck to it, just traditional Eskimo roll, you name it, yeah. I just like it. Better than the shortboards, and it's easier when you get a little older. <laughs> We've spoken oh, really? recently uh, about the the massive strides that are being made in women's surfing. Now, uh, women, women in the waves. You actually started the first women's only learn to surf group on the Gold Coast. Have you yes. been keeping an eye of what's going on at the moment? We had the surf witches on our show a few weeks ago, and it seems to be this massive movement now with the girls getting together and going surfing. Is that exciting for you to see that change from? I imagine back in the early days, you would have been one of the few women in the waves. Oh, I, I think it's brilliant. And they've got a lot now with the mums on boards. They've all given different, um, all the, the women come out with the babies. They're, they're there. Someone minds some of the children while they go surfing. They do it here at Crescent Head. They do it on the Gold Coast. I just think it's fabulous just to see them all as a group. Instead of, you know, instead of going to coffee, they're all hanging at the beach the whole, as a family. And it, and it is good. It's lovely to see. And, and I know the women in the waves on the central coast, they've got a big following. And, you know, and there's a big one too down at Port Macquarie. So, and all the girls, it's, it's the camaraderie and we've always got the guys to back us up anyway. So we're just good. All the old surfers as well, yes. So you know, you're looking a little bit quiet there. <laughs> you got a question? I have to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, Robin, did you have sort of a crew that you'd go surfing with growing up or...? Was it generally like you felt like maybe you were one of the only females in the water or, yeah, what was that like? What, uh, just, what did you say about having a career? Oh, I was saying, um, we, did you have like a bunch of friends growing up that you'd go surfing with often? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, what, we, what used to happen is every weekend at Crescent, like there was only, I used to surf with the guys I went to school with. There was one girlfriend, but they were all boys, and then the rest were the boys and which I had a lot of boy friends as such, that of a weekend you'd get midget and Nat and all the guys would do an eight hour drive, nine hour drive to Crescent Head, come in on the dirt road. They'd be there late Friday night and they were like your big brothers. And they were always on that ball shore up near the breadfruit tree. And for the weekend, we all surfed together. And it was, uh, I must admit that we, I had a great upbringing here at Crescent surfing with the guys. I mean, some, you hear some horrific stories that, some of the girls are intimidated by the guys surfing, but the way I grew up, it was brilliant. And we still had a lot of people surfing here, you know, and you were one of them, they were like your brothers. And then they would sleep in their cars of a night, not really in the weather shed, they, they'd sleep there. And then we'd all go to the movies on a Saturday night, and which only lasted in Crescent Head, which lasted for about an hour and a half. And then they'd go back and sleep in the weather shed and we'd go surfing the next morning. Yeah, so, or my dad, we put the garage door up and the guys had got the train up from Newcastle. Uh, Dad had picked them up from the station. They were allowed to sleep 
on stretches in my in our garage downstairs. So my parents were very supportive back then, and they still would be if they were alive today. But uh, no, they supported supported me in my whole life with surfing. Yeah. So you don't really get much better of a mentor than someone like Midget Farrelly, you know, a, a true gentleman. And I remember at the 64 world title reunion, I have a photo of, um, it's actually th that board that you own. Um, <laughs> and you want to tell people about that board you own and, you know, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got one of Midget's, uh, his stringless Farrelly that he rode in the world titles. And, um, it just sits downstairs in my gym and it's there and it's, I will always treasure that. And then when I went to one of his big functions he had in Sydney, um, I've got photos of me with him and before he passed away. I think he did the next two years later. And he even said to me, Robin, can I buy that board back? I said, I'll never, ever get rid of this, no matter what. It'll go with me, you know. And then I've even, and I've got the Surfing World magazine with the same board in it with a tiny little ding out of the front of the nose. So that's really special. And um, I got that through uh, a couple that was splitting up on the Gold Coast and the wife just wanted to get rid of her husband's surfboards. So I was first in line and, and got it for a few hundred dollars. So it was good. Yeah. Oh goodness, there's, there's a whole, uh, there's a couple of thousand vintage surfboard <laughs> collectors weeping into their copies right now. But, um, <laughs> Speaking of interesting memorabilia, we've got lots of people uh, commenting. Ray Gardner reckons this is pretty awesome to be watching you, Rob. But he said to ask you about that red rashi on the wall behind you. So tell us a bit about what that is and how you got involved in the adaptive surfing. Well, with um, after I had my uh, well injuries, more or less, with all this arthritis, it hit me about oh, 1990, I think it was, a little while back. And I couldn't surf. I think I was surfing in the tidals in Noosa and I couldn't push up. My hands went. Then after, to cut a long story short, all the specialists realised I had bone on bone and the cartilage started to disappear within my body. So I've got like every surgeon, I think, in Australia working on me, putting all this titanium, putting me back together again. <laughs> and um, Bionic woman. It, it, well, it feels like that. I've just had the spine done and my shoulder five weeks ago. So... Um, what I did was I, I, I was involved with the disabled surfing on the Gold Coast and I really wanted to get back in competition, but I couldn't go back to the level that I was at. And I thought there has to be something different. And then I learned about adaptive surfing, and um, which you can adapt. You can still be a surfer and you don't have to, as long as you pass the criteria of having a disability, like and there's a lot of guys, there's some guys, and under the auspicious of Surfing Australia, they ran a nudie adaptive surfing up there at Kingscliff. And I got to meet Mono Stewart and all the guys and I got second up there. But, and there's all different divisions. So then I went to Hawaii uh, four years ago and they had an event there and I went in it to represent Australia. And I came in second or third in my division, which was great. I... What happens is I get pushed on, I can, you have a, an assistant, a swimmer, so you paddle out by yourself or get a jet ski out. Then you can get assisted. Someone will push, but the rest of the wave's up to you. And that saves my hands because I don't want to lose the use of my fingers. And it saves pushing down. So I use my wrists, I get on with my elbows and use my wrists. And if they push, I can then just get straight up. Well, last year, my fourth year over there, I happened to be in, um, the surf really picked up. And I was, everything just fell into place and it was really good. And I was neck to neck with a really young kid. I could have been his grandmother in this division. There's no age difference, there's nothing, we're all the same. And uh, he had, he was in a wheelchair, he had a disability as well. So um, I scored a, a, would you believe a 10 and I won by point whatever and I got a gold medal. So I get, thought, wow. Well, how'd, how'd you get a 10? Would you get barreled or something? Yeah, I did. Would you believe it was? Yes. And everybody just up and yelled. I couldn't hear it. And they had all the Hawaiian announcers and Mono and and all the and Gavin and, and all the guys were flying the Australian flag. So it was good. It, it worked in well. And I thought, wow, what a way to, to step off now. I could get out. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what I would love to do is uh, we, look, we go back every year and we'll go back and assist. And, and I'd like to help other people that 
you know, that have got a disability that want to go further with their surfing, not just, you know, but they're, they're things that you can do. And you just adapt. That's why they call it adaptive surfing, you know, you can adapt. And where about in Hawaii was that one held that you uh, We have it at Waikiki. Okay. Uh, it's right in front of the Duke statue. It's for, and we've got countries all around the world. And uh, I've made that many friends and I've been to that many countries to catch up with everybody. Uh, last year I went to Florinopolis over into Brazil because I have some friends there. And I worked with some of the disabled surfing over there for a day. So I just, I just love assisting, watching people that are blind and, and they, they, they're just killing the waves. They're brilliant. I don't know how they do it, you know? And, um, and I'm thinking, well, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, anyone can do it. You can adapt, yeah. You made a really interesting comment when we were having a chat the other day, Robin, that um, when you started surfing, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't gen multi-generations of families surfing. Uh, so obviously because it was just being invented, you know, so you sort of yeah. were there from the beginning. But you've sent us a, uh, a couple of fantastic photos. I just want to, um, I'll just bring up a couple uh, while we're chatting. But this is uh, Crescent from the Air. Is that uh, back in the 50s or 60s, you were saying? Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, because I can see my family home up there on the on the hill, second from the end, straight across the golf course. Yes, right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, um, that that would have been in the in the late fifties. Yeah. Now, what I found yeah. particularly interesting as well is that there there's been this big controversy lately about this little parking area here in between the caravan park and the beach, and it looks like there wasn't as much parking back then as what there is now. Robin, am I wrong? You are correct there, but um, you know you can't. It is, it's my opinion only, so I'll get that in first. We didn't have a lot of parking at all. We've had the big long weather shed. We had the um, Lady Surf Club, a water tower tank. And, but we were still packed. I think I sent you a photo where, you know, we've had big, we used to have big surf club um, events here. And uh, we didn't have a lot of parking. But now, um, yeah, we, they, they are going to change the car park area, but they're going to make it better. and. Well, I think they are more accessible, but we might lose a few spots, but then we'll gain them somewhere else, you know, so. So, but you're, and you're a proper local. So some of these people getting all upset about things changing from the old days, they're talking about 10 years ago. You, you're the ridgy ditch. You're the real deal. <laughs> and you are right, because nowadays, if we didn't have the young kids and the old people surfing, they, there would be more parking. But I've got a, my girlfriend who used to surf with me when we were young, when we were younger. She's a great grandmother and Robin still surfs too. So there's four generations in the water. But like I said to you before, and same with the boys, like look, listening to, to um, like you've got Jack and all that. They've all got kids. And even Harley, his little girl will be in the water. And his dad surfed, well, there's three generations. But we didn't have that back then. So I suppose the ones that want to leave it the way, don't want to change it and make it whatever and saying, oh, you're going to lose this and lose that. Well, you know, we've got to make it accessible for everybody. It's not just this new crew that's, that's coming to town. I believe it's got to be, um, it's got to suit everybody. And we've got to clean it up. The, the foreshore is getting tatty. It is messy. Um, as um, Maddie would say, as the guys would say, you know, you back right up. They're there right on the, they love that. It's good. You can back up and you're right on the footpath. But, it, but that wasn't like used to happen in our, our days. We had a bit more grass. We had a bit more respect for the people that walked past. Now everybody just puts all their boards, their dogs, everything on the footpath and they're sleeping in the back of their vans. That's fine, but it's right there in your face that you've got to walk around them. We just want a bit more, we just want to make it look a lot nicer. Back, like the old days, really. And you and can and Robin, exactly what you spoke about, where, where it, it is a good vibe, you know, and people want to unload their boards and hang out. But that keyword respect, Phil Jarrett spoke yes. about it on a previous episode about surfing reserves and how people come to Noosa and they're really, they're eggy before they even get in the water. You know, yeah. they've got to, you know, find a park, you know, the, the traffic, everyone at Crescent, they drive to the beach, you know, some have driven hours and they're tired. They just want to park and they want to go surfing. And unfortunately that vibe, is transferred on those crowded days into the lineup and you can sense it. the vibe has changed and it is a newer generation of surfing coming that don't have a hierarchy understanding, uh, call it localism, if you will, but 
you do your time somewhere, you know, like you have, and you do deserve a certain amount of respect, regardless of your age or your ability, just because you, you've put the time in there, you've given to that community and you give back as well. And mm. that respect isn't there. And that, that's where the, I think the main breakdown from my perspective is coming from Sydney up there is there's just not, no respect. It's a free for all in the car park. It's a free for all in the water and the attitudes yeah. are just sour. They've gone. The attitude, it's really sad to see, you know, and they, they don't care once they're there, they're parked there. But we've even got like, a lot of the locals, that, the, you know, the short term locals, they do the same. They park their vehicle and just walk home. And then they can have their car there, even though we've got a four hour park limit, but you know, it's really lenient. And, um, but if you could park back a little bit further, we'd have more grass, we could all sit along there. Then you've got your footpath. That's all we want is to, you know, and they use a lot of the people that are against this council, making the foreshore look really nice and our whole CBD area. Um, they, they, they wanted that they can just drive straight up like you were saying, you know, and, and that's, we, we just want it that we can all enjoy it and use us old people. Oh, the old people need to park closer. No, we don't. We've walked all our lives and if we can't walk, I'll, look, I'll sit down and think one day I won't be able to walk little Nobby, you know, but I've been there, I've done it and somebody else can do it for me, you know, so I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could just follow suit and get a golf cart like all the other surfing legends. I will. <laughs> or an electric scooter or something. That's yeah. all I need to come off one of them, that in Lando or little, little Nobby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of there being like a little drop-off zone, you know, so you can pull up for those who've got heavier boards and things or they've got additional beach yeah. equipment, you know, somewhere you can just pull up, unload your stuff out the car, then go park further away from the beach, you know, so... Well, I think there will be, that there is a, a, an area there they can do that. And round in Willow Street, uh, which is only like another 100 metres away, you can stop there and they're going to put steps down into the water there and you paddle across on your sup or your stand-up paddleboard. But Crescent is Crescent and it can't, we can't make it any bigger because you come to a dead end and then you fall over into the water. You've got to leave. And see, Noosa used, used to be able to park at Noosa and you can't. They got rid of all that. You know, so this and look at the hills they've got to work. We're spoiled here because you can rent a place or stay anywhere and just walk, whatever you want to do, golf, fish, bowls, you never use your car again because we're in that little zone unless you want to go down the back beaches to, you know, plumber and and uh, big hill and race course. So there's no there's no back beaches. <laughs> oh that's what I forgot. Spot X. Spot X. Yeah. <laughs> Well, guess what? I will tell you, the road will be getting sealed to um, to Big Hill. It was announced on Tuesday at the council meeting. So we'll have six k's of um, sealed road on the, on the back road. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I will take my car out of the garage now, Maddie, and I will get it. It won't get dirty. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I we used to come to Crescent Head with the most with the worst road you could ever want. It was dirt the whole way. My sister used to get car sick just coming from Kempsey to Crescent Head. And that corduroy, it was like, that's why it was called that. It had bumps the whole way through it. It took you forever just to get to Crescent Head. What so, car did you guys have growing up in Crescent? <laughs> we had a Dodge. And then we oh, had cool. no, that was my grandfather's. Then my dad had Holden's. And every year or every time a new Holden station wagon came out, Dad had the station wagon. Yes, every one. We, we had it the whole way through. So updated with the times, the, the modern surf wagon. Yes, it was. But my girlfriend had uh, the old FJ because Robin was a couple of years older and we'd put the boards on with the hockey straps. No roof racks, I'd just tie it on your roof and we'd go around the back to, to Spot X and all the other surf features. But then the... The straps would snap, you know, and we're forever getting the, the boards off the, the dirt road around the back. So it'll be good to see some tar road there after all these years. It's really interesting to get the feedback from an, act, an actual legend, like a, a, a local who's <laughs> been there from day one. Actually, I want to show a, a quick photo here, Robin, because even though uh, there wasn't that many people surfing back <laughs> in the days, this is, uh, is this what you and you and yeah, that? That's my dad. That's I'm on the left. My sister, younger sister's on the other side. And behind us, you can see the the old weather shed. That was my at three years of age. That's me in the water at Crescent Head. We'd 
My dad took me surfing every day. Yeah. No, you don't get more old school than that. So anyway. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's what it's called. <laughs> Any, anyone tuning in, this is the lady who gets to say how it goes, all right? You've obviously that, got... A, a that was the weather shed. Uh, sorry, Wixie. I just wanted to, just on that photo, that was the weather shed you see all, not all, but there's some photos oh. of the boys camping um, yeah. back in the day. Yeah, Albie Fowles, all of them. That's why all their names were carved into the into the seats. I, I think they should reinvent that and bring it back in the old style. That would be a real crescent head. Yeah. Awesome. And then you can sleep, you could sleep there. You know, you can pull up, but you pull up behind, you don't have, you, you won't be right on the beach. Hello, you couldn't get any, yeah. any closer, but yeah. And then we had this long weather shed, it was brilliant. It, everyone, it's in a lot of photos. And, and we had the big white boulders that were painted, or well, the big rocks, they painted them white and they had no parking in front of these rocks, you know, so. I, I'm a big believer in the, uh, the adventure to get there being half of the journey. And uh, there's actually a, a place in Perth where I surf and we park you know, a friend of mine, Dave Barlow, and we park at this little car park and then there's a walk track about a hundred meters that way, but we go through the bush. So you mm. get to duck through the trees and that's actually half the fun. And uh, mm. I think when you're going to an iconic break like Crescent, and I used to get butterflies every time I drove down into town, you know, I'd stop in at the servo, see if they needed any wax, go to the bakery, get, get a pasty, and mm. then out in front of the caravan park. And I've been one of those, crusty van people but I always cleaned up my rubbish and yes. told up other people for not cleaning up theirs but I think if you, if you made that little adventure and then you got the walk down through the you know through the golf course down onto the point there I mean if you enjoy that then surely another 50 meters or 100 meters at the start of the adventure it, it, it makes it more, you, you appreciate it more if you had to put a bit of work in to get there I think that lazy mentality is not doing anyone any um, any service yeah, so I, I, you're right, and that's what is happening. They just think, oh, we'll pull up, we'll get out our cooking gear. They all get dressed as they're getting out or whatever they're doing in the back of the bed. It's there, right in your face now. So it's, and it's just bumper to bumper the whole way. And then the aggression, like Maddie said, it's, um, and then they do take it into the water. So it's not how it, it's not how it used to be. And you do miss it, you know. So, and again, it's, a, they're all aggro as soon as they arrive because they're lucky, they're spoiled. They can get there. So now if they've got a, sit back a couple of meters and not park right it's only it's, that's all it is and if we lose six or seven car parks there we'll pick it up somewhere else uh, yeah, robin sorry i'm monitoring the messages we're getting on the facebook feed some of your <laughs> friends are hilarious but uh paul, paul Haler's just making it apparent robin's friend robin strano is a hottie and she's available <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i know what <laughs> Yeah. And Robin still, Robin is my is my surfing buddy. She's a couple of years older, and she surfs every day. And um, so yeah, and she's still going. So it's really good. And you got to keep going too, Kira. Oh, absolutely. I'm aiming for like peaking around the eighties, maybe. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Robin, I'm looking at your profile when I looked over and we had a little chat and I didn't get to ask you a little bit more about um, being involved in the film Rip Girl because you've done so many different things. So can you tell us a bit more about being a surf coordinator for that and what it involved? Yes, what happened was I got a phone call one day on the Gold Coast and they just said, oh, it's Wahini uh, group here. Um, would you be interested in being a surf coordinator? We're putting a film together. And I thought, oh, this sounds good. And we're meeting at Coolangatta, which I found the time out and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, well, this is something different. I don't mind helping out. And prior to that, uh, a friend of mine who I'd met in Hawaii wanted to do a story on me. And the magazine was Wahini. So I had a, a profile done one in a magazine in the States. So I assumed that it was the Wahini magazine had come out. So I go down to this meeting up on one of the floors at Cool and Gatta, and I walk in and there's all these people in there. So I'm sitting down and, uh, and then a guy introduced himself as the director of Walt Disney Studios. And I'm thinking, what? The, I'm in the wrong room. I didn't realise what I, I thought. Oh. I was about to get up. And then I got introduced to the young girl next to me, which was Camilla Bell. She was going to be the movie star in this movie and her mum, and then Jack McCoy was there. And then out of the blue, this fellow came in and I thought, wow, that's George Greenock. 
and George walks in barefooted and poor old, the movie stars in there, they freaked. Uh, Camilla's mum grabbed her and pulled her back for me thinking, wow, who's this guy off the street that's just walked into this meeting? But it was the, the unbelievable George and they had to quieten everybody down because all these Americans realised that, you know, this is the surf industry, this is Australia, you're in a different country. And um, really what it was, Walt Disney's movies, and they were all the directors, and they asked, would I be interested in um, being the coordinator with the girls and the guys that came out from, um, from uh, Los Angeles and Hawaii, and could I look for doubles for them as well, for the surf scenes and hang with them? And I, I was just blown away because I was working and doing other work as well and uh, contracting. And I said, yes. And they said, well, just tell us your price, what you want to, you know, it'll only be for a couple of months. Well, it went for six months. It was brilliant. And uh, I, Nev Hyman's young girl now, she was a, a substitute, she stood in as well. We, I had to, I had the main movie star with me. One of the other movie stars said, yes, well, I can surf. She got the part. When she came over, she couldn't surf. So they just said to me, Robert, we need her surfing tomorrow. I said, it doesn't happen like that. They said, yes, well, it'll have to happen. <laughs> and, Kira, and Kira, that's how I learned about the blue screen because we put her in a rubber ducky at Kingscliff. She'd stand in it and um, she couldn't surf. But they could, it was too late to get anybody back. But um, Is, is uh, that how they used to do the Batman ones? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was. That's, that's and, and we couldn't call it Wahini because A, there was a magazine. So they had to change it and they called, they had to change it to Rip Girls. And so I worked with Camilla and, and all the crew and I got on with the mum and they asked me to stay on for six months and they built a big house like an avocado, up in avocado land. And it was a, all, of, all about a young girl inheriting a property in Hawaii. And we had, we're filming it in Australia and down, especially at, um, down at Kingscliff and around that way as well. We built all the beach shacks as well as Hawaii. And it was funny because the beginning of the movie, we filmed at the end and they had the girls sitting in this plane round of tweed heads in a container on, in seats as though they were catching a plane with an air hostess. And I said to them, look how brown they are. They were supposed to be arriving into a white, <laughs> white American girl. So they quickly had to stop make and up, make, make up. them white. <laughs> But that was, that was really nice. And I met a lot of friends through that. I went back to LA to the premiere of the movie and stayed with Camilla and the mom. And they kept in touch with me. And they used to ring up and say, we're coming to do some work near you. Can you come and meet us? Yeah, sure. Okay, 10,000 BC, I was in New Zealand. Then she did push and I went to Hong Kong. You know. <laughs> wow. So you're a bit and of an overachiever. So on top of everything else, you just instantly become a... Uh... A, a timeline editor for the movies as well. Yeah, it was good. And the other best close friend of mine now is Kathy Gidget Corner, the real Gidget. So I stayed with her in Santa Monica last year when I went over and we've become really close friends as well. So um, because I, she even wears all my Gidget swimwear because I own the Gidget, Gidget label in Australia. So we became friends oh, probably 10 years ago. So um, I keep in touch with her and I go and visit when I go over and yeah, which is good. Now, I know one of the problems these days, Robin, with longboarding is uh, the money's kind of gone out of it a bit as it has with surfing in general, really, when you look at the big brands falling over and so forth. But uh, I want to do a bit more uh, sharing here because um, I, I think we'll find that a lot of our uh, Aussie surfers now will be very jealous to see you. Look at you here and you your endless summer magazine spreads, you're on the Gold Coast sun. But what I'm particularly interested in is this right here. So you were designing boards for Coca-Cola, but you're actually sponsored by them as well. Talk us through how that happened. Well, um, when I started working in the movie industry, um, which was Great Union Cinemas and Roadshow and Birch Carl and Coil, uh, I just, I don't know, it was like the whole... Uh, television, radio, and, and Coke was always everywhere with the things. And then I knew some people that worked in Coke and they even said to me, oh, Robin, we know you're good at design. And can you design the buses on the side of the buses for the Gold Coast? And I said, yeah, I'll give it a go. And they had McCann Erickson. I don't know if they're still working their agency. 
And um, so I, and you're talking about Denny, who wrote that, and Denny and I, on the floor of my house in Brisbane, we designed a bus. And I thought, how, what am I gonna charge them? So, you know, for a measly, I think it was about $800, design a whole bus. And they just said it, you know, they put it in for awards and everything. And we designed buses that ran around the Gold Coast. And I think they would have paid thousands for an ad agency to do it. And then we, I got to become friends with their marketing department and it went from there. And I designed all their point of sale in all the shopping centres for Coke. And then they said to me, you're still surfing? And they said, will you ride surfboards with our Coke sign, you know, with any Coke artwork on it? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So Bob McTavish and um, Neil Purchase was shaping them for me and Gail Austin helped sponsor as well. So the one that's on that picture was on a calendar. And then they, they said, well, can you ride this in some of the Australian titles, which I did. But then there was a bit of controversy with the fellow who did the design, the artwork, who originally did it. So they said, Robin, you can't ride that board anymore. We need you to design a couple of more and you ride them. So I've got a collection of Coke surfboards that they wanted me to ride. And, and then they came in hand. That's another one that we did. And uh, then when I was in the Queensland team and we had to go to, it could have been WA, I just went to them. They were like my family then. And I said, hey, we need some uniforms. They said, oh, that's okay. We'll sponsor you, you know. So um, they helped and, and I'm still friends with them now. A lot of them are working in other big industries. So I'm just doing some work for Vegemite through one of the guys that, um, and designing surfboards and all the artwork for Vegemite underneath their surfboards as well. Have you switched over then to being a digital graphic designer or do you still sort of do it the old no, way? No, I was from the old school. I did all and then, but when I lost the use of my right hand, that really, I didn't know what to do. You know, I thought I can't draw anymore. I can't grip. I can't bend my wrists. And, and that was horrific. And they, everyone said, oh, use a computer. I never wanted to sit inside. I never wanted to be inside four walls. You, you poor old thing. All you can do now is go to Hawaii and win gold medals. But, and um, go all around and help people. <laughs> so, someone did uh, send through saying that uh, from the three judges there in Hawaii, two of them gave you a 10, the third judge gave you a nine and you got booed on the beach. Is that yes, right? that's right. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, look, that's an inspiration. I'd tell anybody to go over and volunteer with that. You know, you've got the wounded warriors. You've got, you've got, I just know, the friendship and the camaraderie with whatever surfing you do, you know, whether it's here or whatever you're involved with, you're part of the ocean and, and it keeps you young, keeps you fit. Yeah. And I just kind of wish some of my grandkids were surfing, but they're all footballers by the sounds. There's going to be all different football, NRLs and AFL and, and maybe get one granddaughter might surf. Yes. As it turns out, they've got about 60 years or so before they can decide to get into it if they want to. <laughs> They have. Well, I just hope that I can keep... Look, I, my goal is to get back in the water after my spine surgery and my shoulder and and then um, to get assisted and someone can just push me on a wave. I'll be right. I'll get back out. Yes. Robin, you... Oh, sorry, Robin. You... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you go ahead, Nathan. No, I was just going to say, when are you having those surgeries, Robin? I've had them. I had my spine... Oh, Oh, right. I had it in October. They they fused C1 and 2, which yeah. I thought was at the, on your back. It wasn't. It was in my skull. <laughs> that got fused just only in October. And uh, I had my shoulder done five weeks ago. Five weeks ago, yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh. So, yeah. yeah, when summer comes, I'll be right. <laughs> Good. Sorry, Sean. Yeah, no, that's cool. Now, Robin, you were talking about your Makapunas playing um, football and that, our rugby league and... But now you had a relationship, a pretty strong relationship with the NRL as well through your um, artwork and that, haven't you? Yes, I did a lot of, um, well, what happened was while I was in hospital, when I, I lost the use of my hands, it didn't stop me from thinking and using my, my brain, which is probably slowing down now. And I started coming up with ideas while I was lying in hospital. And back in the old, olden days, they had, you had all your mascots and um, with all the, the companies and I thought, well, hang on a minute, I might come, I'll come up with some ideas for Canterbury Bulldogs. And I quickly, while I was in hospital, trademarked the name, the Arnold Bulldog Collection and designed a whole lot of uh, merchandising for the Bulldogs 
had it there as a package, rang them, up, rang them while I was in hospital and said, look, I'm gonna send all this down to you. They loved it, trademarked it, and I started doing all their merchandising. And so did all the others. All the other clubs got into it, wanted me to do work for them. And I thought, wow, this isn't too bad. So that was the NRL, the AFL, I started doing um, soft furnishings and merchandising for them as well. So, yeah. You didn't have to use the word do. soft with AFL, all right? Sean will get all excited and run with that. Well, I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> the AFL, but it'll be the Swannies, all right? So that's all right. Nathan and I understand what AFL is. The other guys. I'm sorry, oh, me okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> They're all up in Queensland, aren't they? The AFL players? <laughs> WA, mate. WA. On the West WA. Coast. Okay. WA in Victoria. <laughs> hey, AFL, hey, don't worry. We're um we're 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 all supportive of the um LGBTQT movements <laughs> around the states. So there's no judgment there, Weeksy and Nathan. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you get away with calling rugby league football. There's only one person on the team who's allowed to touch the ball with his foot. I should, <laughs> I should, I should call it running forwards, throwing backwards. <laughs> uh, it, it's funny. I'm in the middle. I got, like I said, one family's NRL that's in Queensland, and the, the others on the Central Coast are AFL. And um, and my great, youngest granddaughter is doing Taekwondo, but she was a foot. She still plays football as well. So because she's got four brothers, she hasn't got any choice. Yes. You, you would have made a great, great diplomat, Robin. But uh, can I ask your opinion of what are the what are the older no, let's say the older people? What are the more mature surfers around Crescent think about the the blow-ins that come cruising into town and don't respect the place. Is, is it, because I live in a small fishing community in Western Australia and where we are, it's not really handy for anyone to get to. It's, 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 it's only an hour and a half out of Perth, but it's, it, it's off the beaten track a little bit. Whereas Crescent obviously is a big name brand. Everyone who travels on the East Coast is gonna to wanna to drop into Crescent. Is it, is it a case of happy to have you here if you do the right thing? Or would you sort of, are you almost tempted to put up a big gate out at Kempsey there at the turn off? Oh, they don't, we don't, I think a lot of them now, uh, all the oldies, we put it per se, they'd love to put the big gate up, you know. But a lot of them think like I do, okay, you know. It's just, again, it's back to respect. If you could get in your respect, it'd be good. But then they've got the guy, all the, the guys go down with the morning crew. They go down at five o'clock in the morning, quarter past five, and get a couple of hours surf in while the young ones are still probably crawling out of their vehicles. And... And that's fine, you know. It's just that, um, yeah, it, it, it's an attitude thing. But the oldies, I mean, we've got a lot of the old surfers have all retired here. You know, Shane's up here and Kenno, Bob Kennison and, and Brian Jackson, they're all here. There's a lot of surfers that are in present now. And, but we just still wander down. We all, we all get on the camaraderie and, and we, are, we do get upset when you see what the attitude is. But yeah. we, it's, it's, we just wonder why their parents can't see it. You know, yeah, exactly. And that's, that's where it starts from, too. And all you, yeah. you hipster yeah. traveling um, blow ins show a bit it's of respect. The hipsters. For I think Maddie and Jack and all those guys should be the next mentors and they should go along and, you know, and I'm sure they will. And I'm hoping that they do, you know, but they're only a small lot because everybody's surfing, you know. Like you were saying, there's that many girls, that many families, and, and we're all surfing right through the back. What's Dylan Hunt's dad's name? Yeah, yeah, young Dylan Hunt is really good on long. Yes, yeah, Steve. Steve, Steve yeah, Steve's Steve, champ. Yeah. And a big, big thank yeah. you to Steve if you're watching. He actually showed me the little, which the little finger of rock to walk out on to jump off. Yeah, at, and the, the fingers. And, and Steve's funny because he will sit in that much water with the rock sitting above his board. I don't know how he does it. So and no one can go inside them. him. No, yeah. you're right. And he'll get them from right around the corner from little lobby and just go to zoom. He'll, he just comes straight across. Yeah. And this is the other thing for you blow-ins to remember. If you show a bit of respect, the locals will actually take you under their wing and they might show you some other spots and give you a few pointers like that. Actually, Robin, talk to us quickly about the um, the Peruvians that came to visit with their reed boards. That was really exciting. I was watching along on that, you know, online. Tell us how that all came about, please. Well, that was um, a phone call from Andy McKinnon and the guys that had arrived into Sydney and they thought, and like within about two days' notice, they said, Robin, we think they Andy rang me, Andy McKinnon rang me and said, we're thinking we'll stop into Crescent Head. I said, oh my God, what are we gonna do? He said, well, can you get everybody together, get the schools, get the newspaper? I said, you're only giving me two days. <laughs> and we did it, I did it. I, um, cause they built the board, they built a, a reed board when they landed in um, Bondi. 
And then they come, when then they got the crescent and they uh, all the guys they all stayed at the Med Motel and we put them all up there to support the all these Peruvian guys. We got the schools involved, the newspaper, the town. They rallied around and um, the guys put the uh, built another board here. You know, they they built one of the reboards and um, they made a little one for me, which was cool. And uh, they enjoyed their days here, and, and now they're my friends on Facebook as well, and everybody else. You know, they want you to go and travel to their places as well. So I, I, I'm starting to see why everyone's your friend. You're a testament to a, a life well lived, <laughs> as one of your friends has commented. But uh, and certainly a great ambassador for the sport. I, I mean, proud to have, proud to proud to be following in your footsteps. Well, you've got to make a visit to Crescent. Oh, so I, we can I, get through. I can't. I can't get from Western Australia at the oh, moment. No. But, uh, well, but I. I, 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 I What's that? Uh, your borders close in WA week C as well. No, I mean Western Australia as a whole is is one big state again. We were broken up into seven areas, but that was months ago now. But um, no, we, there is talk about maybe opening our border with the other states that aren't COVID infested. So everyone except for Victoria and New South Wales. Um, but uh, I don't know, Robin. I know a few backtracks. I might be able to get down there for a visit. But, but then uh, I heard, I heard your premier that he just wanted to cut off Western Australia and push it out a bit. And you have your own state, so we'd have to paddle across or stand up, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> might as well be an international flight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what. I, when I surfed Margaret River, I was so glad that I got knocked out in the. I think it was the quarterfinals because. I would have drowned in the finals. It was just unbelievable. Yes, I, I, was, I would not have gone in. And that was back in what, 1996 or something. 96, yes. yeah. Yes. And so is Alan and Diane Loveday still in town? Tell them I said Yes, that. and yes. And they've, uh, they don't have the garage, the service station anymore, but they do help out. They're, they're involved. Well, Alan is with the Lions Club a lot. And Diane, yeah, we're all stuck here. We're all in prison there. I made some. In, in, I've only probably been there maybe eight or ten times. I've done, I used to any time there was a hint of a wave. I, I, it's well worth the drive in off the highway, even when uh, Diane didn't need any wax or leg ropes and things. But uh, it really is a special, beautiful place, and I hope that you can um, achieve a good result for all stakeholders in town. And yes. frankly, I mean, I'm a big believer in do what's right for the people that live there and let the let the out of town yeah. have to deal with a little bit of inconvenience if that's what's required because it's not fair for to lose that amenity of your life. But what, what's what's been the biggest change in in all your years? What what would be the one thing that you would never have expected would happen? You know, as far as surfing in Crescent. Oh, but we've still got the we've still got the I don't know we've still got the same things. You know, the point we've got the track, we've got the beach, and it's funny listening to people say now, oh look at all the sand. It's going to ruin everything. I said, hang on a minute. We used to sunbathe along there. My, my auntie, who's 95, used to go down with a little bucket and spade and, and try and get the water to run out of the creek, you know. And where the caravan park is around the other side there, there was a big hole there. I learned to swim there, you know. It was, used to fill up. It was brown water. It was tannin, you know. But we've still got the same um, shoreline. We've still got the same point and... Whatever the seas want to do, they bring the sand in and take it out. And, yeah. and you know what is exciting? We have got rid of the old toilet block that was there when I was a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> one change. <laughs> this little old toilet block and we opened a new one. Would you believe that's about the newest thing that's happened? And now they want to, which is great because council now want to just smarten everything up and make it accessible for everybody because you know like i said we're all living longer there's elderly people there's kids there's everybody we didn't even have disabled toilets and now you know we've, we're starting to get we've, we've got to look after everybody it's not just that group we've got to look after everyone it's you such know, a beautiful like, amazing place and like yeah. i reckon one thing you could do is get one of those surf cams there but then get some footage on a really bad day and just <laughs> just run that on the loop so all the they, ladies, had, they, all the, they did have a surf cam on the old surf club, but it got egged that many times yeah. and um, it didn't work. You have to pull up with your phone. <laughs> it's that laziness now. Everyone's on their mobile phone checking the surf and everything. That's what I'm saying. If you just record it on a, the worst day ever yeah. and then just have that on a loop and all those lazy people won't come into town. Well, you'll have to do a deal with Telstra and Optus and Vodafone and get them to do that for all the surf breaks. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, good. Well, Robin, I guess one question would be, what haven't you done? Um, but does anyone else have any more questions for Robin before we wrap it up? I just wish we had a whole extra hour. I think we've, we're only uh -huh. scratching the surface of Robin. I think we're going to get a lot of follow-up questions and we're probably going to have to do another show. Oh, good. Uh, I could handle that, yes. But I, I like Kira's question, though. Uh, it, what, what you know what I haven't done that I would like to do? And that is to do diving, scuba diving. And, and the reason I haven't done that, you know, I'm from the old school. Things. I know there's all this stuff like I can't even work computers properly. But I always used to think if I dived down the water, I was always bad at maths. And if I couldn't count, I wouldn't be able to come up. In time. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my, and, and I would love to do, do diving. I would love to, you know, I've swum with dolphins and I've got the whales and I can snorkel and I teach surfing and I teach swimming, but I've never dived. But, and it was all of the fear of not, being, of not knowing how to get up and dive. What, what the <laughs> I have to say, I only dived for the first time this year up in, for, uh, in Cairns on the reef yes. and I just wish I'd done it ages ago. It's just like the most surreal thing. Well, there's some good, there's a good diving spot at Southwest Rocks, at Fish Rocks. So there's some real, you know, I, I will do it and I'll have to do it in a swimming pool with a real good instructor. <laughs> yeah, you can come with me. <laughs> I, I reckon based on your, your history, Robin, you'll do it and then you'll end up being a world champion at it or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be the old, no, no, there's still some, some old grannies still doing things, you know. I won't jump out of a plane. In fact, it's funny now, you walk up Little Nobby, we used to climb down that cliff. I used to, we used to get it on bits of cardboard on Big Nobby and when we were kids, we'd come over that hill in front of my dad's, you'd fly over there. As the cardboard went right over the cliff, we dived off and went left. No way. And that's what we did. And then at low tide, you'd walk around in all the caves that are there with all the bats right at the back of the caves. That's in, that's at Shelley Beach in the, that section there. But now when I get up on the edge of Little Nobby, my legs are like jelly. So it's weird, <laughs> you know. And I, You're getting more sensible in, in your later years. Oh, it is in my later years. I've got to do something <laughs> sensible. <laughs> Um, so just a, a little piece of housekeeping. Sorry, Kira, I should have... No, go for it. Kira's our host this week uh, in, in honour of having <laughs> Legend Robin on board. But uh, I spoke with Luke Sorensen today. He's had a big computer crash, which is why we haven't yet announced our photography competition winner. But he's bought himself a fancy new computer, so he's going to send through the winner's details tonight. So we can announce that during the week. But back to you, Kira. Well, my <laughs> question is for Sean is to explain what we've got happening on next week's show. Mm. Um, yeah, well, next week, <laughs> now, we, we've got Albie Pittman. Now, not too many people will be aware of Albie. He, he did work up the Noosa Festival for us this year. And um, when he'd finished on the beach each night, he entertained everybody with his music. He was there uh, playing away. And Albie is a travelling minstrel. He just cruises around going wherever, playing his music and enjoying life and, um, you know, going for a surf and that. And uh, just for something different, I thought we'd get him on and have a talk to somebody who's low key and just totally cruising without a profile or anything. So uh, looking forward to talking with him. If we can get Robin to tag that on her social media, he'll be famous as well. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Actually, I'm still learning. Yeah. Awesome. One of the so, things um, I was going to mention too, and probably interests Robin, she hadn't heard, uh, we've got a new candidate running for the Burley seat in the state election. Rabbit. Is everyone else gone? Has everybody else gone paused on that? And I'd just like to thank Robin on a personal note because uh, but, um, one of the things that she said very early on was uh, the way the contest was going, it would need professional management. And that gave me the um, little twig in the mind that's led me down to the path of, yeah, becoming a 
contest promoter, professional contest promoter. So thank you, Robin. You're welcome. Thanks, Sean. Well, it sounds like, Robin, you've been an inspiration to a hell of a lot of people, especially considering our Facebook page has just blown up with the live stream. It was all the love for you. Um, it's been super wicked talking to you, and I feel like we could definitely talk for another hour, so we might have to get you back on the show again. Um, but from all the team here at Oz Longboarding, and Weeks, he might want to put us into Brady Bunch mode, possibly, because he's in charge of the controllers, even though I'm talking. Yes. Um, so... Thank you so much for watching, everyone. You can find our show on YouTube and we'll see you next week on episode 15 of Oz Longboarding. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming in, Robin. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.